expand this. Hopefully this works. Good evening, everybody. That's a lot better than last time. Um, at least it looks like it will be. Is it starting up? Starting. Check my tweet. I think we're good. We're good. All right, everybody. I'm going to buy some time until more people join. Tweeted out the link. Hi, everyone. I'm Lance Lysowski, the Buffalo Sabres beat writer for the Buffalo News. Hopefully the connection is good. Hopefully we're good to go. Um, I don't know why Facebook always has to change their Facebook Live setup. It's so confusing. I'm 30 years old. I don't know how to work it properly, but um buying a little time here we're still a few minutes early i guess trying to give people an opportunity to join in of course if anybody who's joining me please um if you have a question put it in the comment section at the video i will get right to it um plenty to discuss i think we did one two weeks ago uh, a lot of really great questions that one lasted around 35 minutes i like to keep it around 30. uh in case anybody who's in the buffalo area watch sports talk live on wgrz uh vic carucci and jay skirsky are on there tonight uh, i always like to plug my co-workers uh, appearing on a program but uh i'm lance lasowski buffalo sabers beat writer for the buffalo news here to, to talk hockey um we're still a few months out from the season starting probably but i know everybody needs an outlet to to talk about it um slow sports night monday night football game's not great uh you guys are all probably still soaking up that bills win from yesterday so i figured let's talk uh let's talk sabers so uh right off the top the biggest news from yesterday at least was sam reinhardt and linus allmark signing with the sabers so reinhardt and allmark are both under contract makes things a little bit easier for kevin adams we know how much cap space is available victor olsen is the next guy who needs signed casey middlestad still isn't under contract so some housekeeping items for kevin adams uh to take care of over the next few weeks i don't know we'll, i'll i'll answer your questions uh, again, for those, for those of us who rejoined me a little bit late, I'm Lance Lansowski, Sabres beat writer for the Buffalo News. So here to answer all of your questions. Uh, always good to talk to you guys. Thanks for joining me on a Monday night. Thought Figured slow sports day, no World Series, bad Monday night game, so let's talk hockey. So with Reinhardt and Allmark under contract, I'm going to get into it. Uh, as soon as you guys start to, to, answer, to ask some questions, we'll switch over to the the Q&A side of things, that's always a lot better than me just talking. So if you have anything on your mind about this team, just put it in the comments section. I can see it on the left side here. Um, makes things a little bit easier to, uh, yeah, to answer your questions. This is what this is all about. I want to talk to you guys. I want to hear from you guys. Uh, anything about this team, hockey, the league, whatever's on your mind, I'll answer it as long as, you know, to the best of my ability. So there we go. We got some questions coming in. So, um... I'll, I'll just go up to the top, off the top, and I'll, I'll talk about what I think is on everybody's mind is whether or not the Sabres are going to make a move now that they have Reinhardt and Allmark under contract. So right now, as things stand, the cap space is around $6 million, uh, right around there, to sign Victor Olsen. I don't think he's going to command all of that, but you also need to take into account the cap overage that the Sabres will probably going to pay uh either half of or maybe they bump it back to next year we haven't gotten an answer yet on kevin adams for that it was 1.275 million and obviously this team's going to want some cap space to make a move at the deadline dylan cousins is not accounted for on that total so you're gonna have to add him to the mix and we'll see how rosters work out for this season if it's a truncated schedule are they gonna have expanded rosters it's something to keep in mind but you know, generally, I'm sure people are going to have a question about this. I don't really see this team making a big trade in the next few weeks. Uh, we There's still time left. Remember, the season is probably not going to start until, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to start until February, and that's best-case scenario at this point. So there are, it's not like the roster is set right now. There are time to make, There is time to make moves. I don't think the Sabres want to handcuff themselves too early. And in case you missed it, some of the top free agent forwards are still unsigned. Like Mike Hoffman hasn't signed anywhere yet. So... There's still some pieces on the chessboard um, that need to that are in play. Maybe they add a depth forward. Maybe they go ahead and acquire a goalie. I don't see that happening now that they have six million dollars tied up in Linus Allmark and Carter Hutton. But 
something else to take into account here. After they finish arbitration with Victor Olsen, this team is going to have a 24-hour buyout window. So they do have the option of exercising that. I don't see it happening. But uh, who really knows the new GM in play? I, I wouldn't buy out Kyle Lockpozo. Maybe they do that. Maybe Carter Hutton's an option. But if you're buying out Carter Hutton, you better have a good goalie uh, to rely on in, in the event you get rid of one because you can't rely on Jonas Johansson's on an NHL goalie at this point. I don't know if he's going to develop into one. Uko Pekalukanen is not ready yet. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Chuck, Chuck, thanks for joining me. Um, always appreciate the participation. Uh, Chuck, how do you feel about the draft, specifically the Jack Quinn selection? I really liked the Sabres draft. They don't have quantity. Uh, trading up to pick Paterka in the second round is part of that. They also traded picks for Colin Miller. Well, Colin Miller's the big one. The Jeff Skinner trade as well. So, what, I think only five total selections, but I really like the top three in particular. I think, you know, Matteo Cosentini, I think a lot of people will think it's just a, a homer pick because he was a Buffalo Junior Sabre, but he's having a really nice start to the season in the British Columbia Hockey League. I've heard a lot of good things about him. Paterka should have been a first-round pick, so that's an excellent... It addresses an area of need. It's a goal scorer. This team needs more goal scorers. And I know that the fan base wanted Marco Rossi in the first round, but Jack Quinn was the top goal scorer. He was the top right wing. Both of those are areas of need for this team, and everybody I keep speaking to about Jack Quinn... You know, it's not like this kid was only scoring with, you know, with a shot in the right circle. He was scoring goals in a number of ways, which makes you really, really like that he's rounded out his game. He's getting to the net. He's scoring in, in those difficult areas, played in a lot of different situations. Uh, it does give you a little cause for concern that he, he had one really good year in the Ontario Hockey League. But let's see how his development goes moving forward. You know, he's probably going to be back in Ottawa uh for next season he's gonna play for canada at the world junior championships i don't see jack quinn as being an option for the sabers although people close to him at least ones that i've spoken to seem to believe that he's physically ready uh, it's physical it's different to be physically ready to play one nhl game but he's gonna have to play 82 in a truncated schedule i think it's best for his development and the sabers have already giving themselves a lot of really good options on the wing, you know, in the forward group at this point. So I don't think they necessarily need him. But Chuck, to answer your question briefly, really good pick. I, I like Paterka as well. Uh, credit to Kevin Adams and his staff for being aggressive. They saw that Paterka was still available. Um, again, talented winger, goal scorer, love the upside. He's going to be playing in Germany's top league, you know, barring coronavirus, um, their league over there isn't going to start until late December at the earliest. But right now he's playing games in Austria. Nice little uh, consolation there, getting some games in against guys that are a lot older. That's a, a very important piece of this. Uh, Denver, thanks for joining me, Denver. Good to see you again. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for, for the questions. Really good to have you. Uh, you know, I see that we have people trickling in here. So a little bit slow start to the day, but I sort of sprung this on everybody. We, used, we usually like to do these on our designated day during the off season, but you know what? I... You know, saw an opportunity. Figure we why not talk hockey tonight. So, Denver, I think Adams is doing a really good job so far. I think so. I, I definitely agree with you, Denver. Uh, really good point. I there's all you know. There's question marks about how the the staff changes in Rochester are going to go. That's the one thing I have disagreed with. Um, I disagree with a few other things, but most notably is the decision to get rid of Chris Taylor. Who, in case you guys missed it, Chris Taylor, the former Amherst coach, is going to be an assistant under Lindy Ruff in New Jersey. I think he's going to be outstanding there. I think Chris Taylor has the, the potential to be a future NHL head coach. That's a decision that is definitely a head-scratcher. Uh, maybe Seth Atbert does well there, but that's the one the one area I'm concerned about. The lack of an assistant general manager is another head-scratcher as well when it comes to the Sabres. Maybe they hire somebody in the future. But given the circumstances, um, the assets available, the cap space, uh, some really difficult arbitration situations to walk into for Kevin Adams. He's really managed this well. And you have to give credit where credit is due with Ralph Kruger and his ability to lure Taylor Hall. Lure is a really weird word to use. I know that's one we, we typically use in sports. But he convinced Taylor Hall to sign with the Sabres on a one-year deal with $8 million bucks. Kevin Adams goes out and trades for Eric Stahl, I like the Tobias Reeder signing for the Sabres. Another guy that Ralph Kruger brought in. Reeder's going to make a really significant... He's going to be a significant upgrade on that penalty kill, in my opinion, which is an area of need for the Sabres. Remember, if this team just figured out their 
their special teams last year. They're a much better group. Um, special teams really and were really an Achilles heel. The big question now, Denver, is goaltending. Is Kevin Adams... Kevin Adams is gambling on Linus Allmark and Carter Hutton. As of right now, maybe there's another move to be made once they figure out the Victor Olsen situation. But that's my big question. You're going into this year with a much better team at 5-on-5, five five, at least in, at the forward position. Uh, much better depth at forward. Um, but... And it's a big but. Are you going to be able to to receive enough saves every night to to be a contender in the Eastern Conference? It's not going to be easy. I don't know necessarily if the Atlantic Division is going to be as strong as we've seen in recent memory. That's again if we don't have realignment. But hypothetically, I don't like the Maple Leafs off season. Um, Tampa is going to have to do something at some point to be cap compliant. Boston's group took a real big hit uh, with losing. Tory Krug, their blue line's not as good, although, you know, the Craig Smith signing is impeccable. Goodbye then to do that one. But in my, you know, to summarize, I think that there's an opportunity here to make a jump, even though the Metro got better. But, you know, you got to have a goalie, and you're going to have two goalies now with what's going to be a truncated schedule. I don't know if the Sabres have that. Jody, thanks for joining me, Jody. Uh, good to see you. Um, thanks for the question. Always appreciate you guys participating. Good opportunity just to catch up with you guys again. In case anybody's joining me late, I'm Lance Lysowski, the Sabres beat writer for the Buffalo News. Jody, what do you think of all the one-year deals? Anything to make of it? Uh, Jody, with with Ry- Sam Ryder wasn't going to want to sign long-term this offseason anyway. Remember, it's a flat cap. It's only $81.5 million. And when you're considering what a long-term extension is going to be, we usually look at it as percentage of the salary cap. So for Sam, that's 8%, roughly, 7%. So, you know, his average annual value is only going to be $6.5 million at that rate. Well, if he has another big year, which he's in line to do, especially if he's playing on that top line with, with Jack and, and, and Taylor Hall, he's in for an even bigger pay grade, you know, next offseason, or, you know, if he reaches unrestricted free agency in 2022. I think this is more on Sam Reiner wanting to, to wait this out than maybe it is necessarily for the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, which is good, a good move for by, by both sides. If Sam was going to sign long-term this offseason, he was going to set the price very high, which he should, probably in the $7 million range. And you're not going to budge because you have all the leverage. He could take advantage of arbitration each of the next two off-seasons. And I think the Sabres right now, they're waiting to see what's going to happen with Taylor Hall. If he has a big year, they're absolutely going to try to sign him long-term. And that's going to be very expensive. It's going to really hinder the Sabres' ability to sign everybody. You can't bring everybody back. And that Rasmus Dahlin extension is is sort of looming over the Sabres at a certain point. He's only a restricted free agent next offseason, but he's somebody you're going to want to get under contract because if you're not careful, he's only going to get more expensive um, with, with, you know, if he reaches the ceiling that you're expecting. And, of course, the Sabres signed Eakin to a two-year deal and unrestricted free agency so they can expose him to the expansion draft. A very smart move. You need a, you need some of those two-year deals to expose, you know, to have some people who are eligible to be picked by Seattle. Uh, the reader signing was league minimum, so that's 700000 Um Linus Allmark, I think, again, that's probably – I think Linus Allmark, the decision to go one year with him was a Sabres decision. They want to see what he's capable of. You're not going to commit to Allmark – beyond this season until he shows you he can stay healthy and that he's a starting goalie. You're not going to pay starting goalie price for somebody who could potentially regress, who might not be good enough on the penalty kill. Remember, as much as Olmark's save percentage at 5-on-5 five five was encouraging, he also benefited from facing poorer shot quality. Now, when Victor Olsson went down with that injury back in, what was it, January at this point? Um, he... The, Ralph Kruger made a concerted effort to have his defensive zone coverage keep teams to the perimeter. I mean, you want to do that a lot of times, but I think there was more of a, a focus on it with Olsen out because they knew that they weren't going to score enough goals. Now, facing sh- more shots in the perimeter, Olmark was it kind of juiced his numbers a little bit in terms of save percentage. So I think that when we look at Olmark, we need to remember that he wasn't facing the same chances that Carter Hutton was the previous season. That's a big piece of this. So until Venus Allmark shows maybe a more a larger body of work, you're not going to want to commit to, to more than one year. Now, I think that Victor Olsen is somebody that the Sabres will want to sign 
beyond this season. So that's something to look out for in the coming weeks. I think that's that's going to be the delay. The Sabres have been talking to his agent since July. There wasn't a lot of traction when I spoke to sources a week and a half ago, two weeks ago at this point. But the Sabres were trying to get Reinhardt done. They were trying to get Allmark done. Now they can circle back and sign Casey Middlestad, who isn't ar- arbitration eligible, but he is a restricted free agent, as well as Victor Olsen. So Middlestad's a very interesting case. He has zero leverage after the season he had. He's probably going to be in Rochester again unless he has an impeccable camp. I think for him, it's it's trying, you know, the Sabres probably want to get some term there. They don't want to just do a one-year deal. You know, he probably wants some financial security at this point, although he hasn't earned it. So it's going to be an interesting balancing act when it comes to the middle side. I'm very curious to see where he fits in uh, in their plans. So, again, anybody who's joining me late, I'm Lance Lysowski, the Sabres beat writer for the Buffalo News. Taking your questions, comment sections there for you to use. If anybody's asked a question already, ask two. There's no limit. I'm going to go with this as long as it feels natural. Um, some weeks we have a lot of questions. Some weeks we don't have as many. So I appreciate everybody's participated so far. Andrea, how do you feel about the Arizona Coyotes draft pick who pleaded guilty in juvenile court to racially, racially motivated hate crimes? So in case any of anyone else has missed this, the Arizona Republic uh, came out with a really – Disappointing, I guess is the one way to put it. story. Um, really well reported, but it's disappointing in, in the sense of just the topic. And the topic was that the Coyotes' top draft choice, who wasn't a first-rounder, by the way, I believe he was ch- chosen in the fourth round. I like, would have to go back and check this. Uh, but, yes, made racial comments and basically bullied um, a child when he was in the eighth grade. I believe it was eighth grade. I could be wrong about that, An- Andrea. Um, really horrible, horrible behavior um, from a child. And it, it raises questions. And I know that I don't know as much about the Sabres' current scouting staff as I did the last one. But I know the last one, if there were any character concerns, and this would most definitely fit under the umbrella of character concerns, those players were taken out off of the Sabres' draft board. Um I wouldn't be surprised if that's the same way uh, under Kevin Adams. I'm sure that it probably is for a lot of teams. As we saw this player in question fall down the draft a little bit, it's disappointing. It's particularly just disappointing, Andrea, that this didn't come out publicly until three and a half weeks after the draft, and it was a newspaper that did it. I think that it would have been best for both sides, the player and the team, if they came out after the draft and, and pretty much reveal, like, listen, this player in question committed this as an eighth grader. It was horrific. Um, Here are the steps that he's taken over the past several, you know, five, six years to address that behavior. Here's how he's moving forward. Has he reconciled with the family that, you know, he obviously impacted in a significant way. Um, Bullying doesn't just affect a child in the moment. It can affect them for years. So uh, I think that the league needs, needs to take a look at this. I think that every team in their scouting departments need to take a look at us. The Coyotes, who were a disaster in in some ways, at least that's what I've heard before they made these latest changes, it raises questions. Um, Be transparent about these sort of things. You know, I'm all for second chances, but the way this was handled by the Coyotes, the athlete in question, and even the league to a certain extent, it's disappointing, and especially for a league that needs to be much better in terms of equality, being more accepting. And it doesn't sound like this player has really reconciled with the person that he bullied. I mean, come on, that's horrible. It's horrible. So if anybody hasn't read it, I would encourage you to go check out the story in the Arizona Republic. Uh, they do very quality journalism down there. They absolutely do. So something to go read. Um, it's a problem. And again, we've seen these sort of instances happen in drafts with other, other leagues, other organizations. We saw what happened with Jake, what Jake from was it with the, the bills chose. So um, yeah, that's all I really have to say about Andrea. It's, it's horrific and disappointing. And I, I hope the team sort of open their eyes to what needs to happen in the future. They knew about this. It's not like the Cody, the Coyotes are surprised. I think the transparency and, and reconciliation is, is a huge part of this. You can't just say you improved and not go to the people you impacted and try to make a difference in their lives after you've obviously said and performed a lot of heinous acts uh, at that point. So thank you for the question, Andrea. Uh, Garrett, uh, do you see any way the Sabres resign off if everything goes well in Buffalo this season? Garrett, I do. Uh, the, big qu- the big problem here, though, is that, Garrett, let's say, 
let's let's approach this from a best case scenario standpoint. Hall loves Buffalo. He has a huge season playing with Jack Eichel. The Sabres make the playoffs, uh, which I believe this team has a potential to do after the changes they made, although I think they shouldn't be done. The price tag isn't going to be $8 million on a long-term extension. I don't think he's going to give the Sabres a hometown discount. I just really don't. But hey, I didn't think he would sign here in the first place. So I've been wrong before, and a lot of reporters have been. Let's just say hypothetically he does, and the price tag is 9 to $10 million a year on a long-term deal. Remember, you've got Jack Eichel, $10 million a year. You've got Jeff Skinner, $9 million a year for six more years beyond this one. Sam Reiner, long-term, is going to be... $7 million? And that's if the Sabres sign him next year and he has another good year. Um, that price tag is going to keep going up. Victor Olsson, if his development continues to trade upward, that price tag is going to keep going up. Rasmus Dahlin, uh, these this is the problem when you have good players and you don't handle their contracts the right way. Now, the issue here is that the Sabres, rather than signing Sam Ryder to a bridge deal in, in what was it, September 2018, they should have extended him then. They should have. Now, I know it was sort of still a new GM. Jason Botterill wanted to probably see more out of Sam Reiner. And, but I'm sorry. Uh, right now, you're in a really tough spot with Sam and Taylor Hall. You can't afford everybody the Rasmus Dahlin contract. I don't think Henry Yoki Haru is ever going to be a very pricey player based on probably the limited point production. I just don't think he's going to be that kind of guy, although he's going to be solid. Uh, and the Sabres do benefit from having some entry-level contracts coming up. Cousins, Quinn, hypothetically, Lukanen. But still, you can't afford everybody. Uh, Taylor Hall is going to get much more lucrative offers if this if this goes well. You're going to need some sort of a discount from him. You're going to that's that's what's going to take. Or Sam Reinhart. And I mean, if I'm Sam at that point, he's already pretty much taking a, a, a discount this year. I think that 5.2 for Sam is sort of a discount for the Sabers. They got lucky. I think it's a million, probably a million cheaper than he was going to get in arbitration. So. Juggling act uh, that won't be easy, but it's a good problem to have, Garrett. They make the playoffs. Taylor Hall scores forty goals, and you know you, you want to go ahead and sign him. Great. Uh, then you can try to move the money at, at your disposal if you can. But I think right now, really tough one to pull off. Uh, Bruce, do you feel optimistic the Sabers will make the playoffs? Bruce, they need to do something about that blue line. They still have too many right shot defensemen. Brandon Montour is not good enough on the left side. Uh, and like I like Brandon Montour as a player. I think he catches way too much grief from from Twitter and, and fans and the analytics people. I think he's a player whose numbers, and that includes analytics, have been weighed down significantly based on who he's played with, the system that he's played in. He's been on some bad teams the last few years. I would like to see Brandon Montour play on the right side, be given a real opportunity to succeed in Buffalo, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. If he stays, he's going to be probably stuck on the left side. Huge mistake. For me, I'm trading one of those defensemen. Based on the types of demon that they have, the contracts, it probably makes the most sense to trade Montour. Uh, Miller is under contract for two more years, so you can expose him in the, the expansion draft because they're going to want to protect Yuki Haru. They're not going to want to lose a player that's that young with that much upside. And goaltending. Uh, goaltending is a big one, Bruce. I, I like Carter Hutton. I think Carter Hutton, I'm, <laughs> I think he's going to rebound in a big way. Vision issue is fixed. Remember, the year before, 2018-19, despite playing in a horrible system uh, with not the best personnel, his save, his PK save percentage was 885. That's like 50 points better than Walmart. I don't know the numbers in front of me, but much better. That's why the Sabres PK was so much better, was Carter Hutton the year before. The guy can play in this league. I know that he's, he might not be that number one. I think the Sabres' problem right now is they have two 1B options in Hutton and Walmart. And you need that starter, that number one guy that the Sabres have not had since Ryan Miller. Uko Pekalukinen might be that in a year or two. Um, the Sabres are hoping that he is. He's not now, though. And I think that you need to go out and need to get somebody. But I don't see it happening based on the cap situation, the assets the Sabres would need to give up to acquire a goaltender, and the asking price. I mean, if I'm the Arizona Coyotes and you know I'm dangling Darcy Kemper out there in the trade market, I'm asking for a second-round pick. And the Sabres don't have a third rounder next year, so they're not going to want to trade a second. Remember, this draft, they only had five draft choices. So you can't go two straight years with thin drafts when you're not a competitive team. Now, I'll, I'll re rephrase that. You can't do that when you're an organization that doesn't have a deep prospect pipeline. Sabres just aren't good enough in that respect to be trading that many draft picks. Um, that's what makes the Jimmy VC trade, well, the failed Jimmy VC trade. That one didn't really work out for Buffalo. Kind of a hard pill to swallow. 
losing a third round pick for a player that obviously fell very short of expectations last season. So I think the Sabres can do it, Bruce. They need to get contributions from guys like Tage Thompson. Cody Eakin needs to be good. Good. I mean, 15 to 20 goals good and strong defensively. Much stronger than he's been the last few years. And there's just nothing, Bruce, that indicates to me that Cody Eakin is going to be good. Um, injuries the last few years. And he's got a, a, a history of injuries, including to his knee. You don't want to see that. Um, yeah, I mean, he was bad last year. Some of it was circumstance. I will withhold judgment. Uh, maybe he's better in a, in a uh, complimentary role in Buffalo if he's playing with better players. But I think the problem with the Sabres right now is they're going to have Cody Eakin playing with probably Tage Thompson and maybe Tobias Reeder, perhaps, you know, Victor Olsen gets bumped down to the third line. Um, they're going to need somebody there to try to spark that third line to create some offense because Cody Eakin, they need to get something out of him. And Curtis Lazar needs to show that he can replace Johan Larson. This is all about developing depth. And I want to see Rasmus Dahlin take Rasmus Rist the line in his minutes. Dahlin needs to be that top pair guy and thrive in that role. There's a lot of ifs there. Um, but you know what? A, a bubble team like the Sabres, right now I would put them like on that bubble, right? They're in that group of teams that if things go well, yes. You know, they, they can, they're better than the Florida Panthers. They absolutely are, in my opinion. I'm not listening to the hype about the Ottawa Senators because Matt Murray's been bad the last few years and that team's still not going to be strong enough defensively. They're still too young. So there's an opportunity. Um, the window is open for them to, to be a playoff team, but... There are some things that need to go right, and special teams need to be fixed by Kruger and his staff. Uh, Derek, see any other signings? You agree with them giving up on Cahoon? Derek, I think that they might still be open to Cahoon, but you know, I think that this might have been a. I don't know this for certain because Dominic Cahoon's agent has not responded to my phone call since the night of the NHL draft, <laughs> which I don't blame him actually, um, because he's probably talking to other teams and he doesn't want to negotiate through the media. But um, I think that Dominic Cahoon's can probably set the price tag too high. Knowing that if the Sabres said no and he accepted that qualifying offer, he could take them to arbitration. His price in arbitration would have been around two million bucks. The Sabres didn't want to take Dom. They did not want Cahoon going to arbitration. They wanted to keep Dominic Cahoon at their desired price tag, which I would say at most was probably one point five million dollars. Now again, you're going to see a lot of people bring up that Zemgus Gergensen's contract. Gergensen is making two point two millions. Well, you know what? Zemmus Gergensen's had more goals last season than Dominic Cahoon, and he, he was one of the best defensive forwards in the National Hockey League. He played every night against guys like Connor McDavid and Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin. Like, there's value in that. And sure, I still think it's an overpay, but that's the reason why you're seeing those two discrepancies. They're much different players. Dominic Cahoon might not even play it on the Sabres' second power play unit based on their personnel. I like the fit, I like the player, but it had to have been at the right price tag. And you know what? I think that his agent overpriced him. And that's why you ha you haven't seen him sign. I bet you he's had a lot of $700,000 one-year contract offers. Not great, okay? You know, Dominic Simone, a guy for Pittsburgh who I really like, who's proven that he can play with top-line players with the Penguins, signed for only one year $700,000 with the Calgary Flames. It's a good chance, based on the economy and Dominic Cahoon's, you know, he missed time with a concussion. He, he hasn't been a versatile player to this point in his career in the National Hockey League. He's still developing. And that's, not, like, remember, undrafted player. Didn't come to Germany until two, from Germany until two years ago. Still a lot of development to happen there. So I think that it was a player and his agent who overpriced him. And if I'm the Sabres, I... I wouldn't have given him a qualifying offer either. I would have given him a contract offer. If he says no, you continue to negotiate. Okay, because I'm not paying him $2 million through arbitration. I'm not. He's not a $2 million a year player right now. Disagree all you want. I'm sure a lot of people do. But they couldn't pay him that when they had the opportunity to go out and get Taylor Hall. Now, if it's me, I'm circling back to Dominic Cahoon and I'm saying, listen, here's an offer one year, $1.25 million. It's still a, a raise from what you received last year. Take it or leave it. And I think he would take it at this point because I know how much he liked Buffalo. He loves the system. He's a perfect fit for it. And the Sabres do need some insurance at Ford. I know they're penciling in Tage Thompson to be this guy for them. Well, Tage Thompson's played one NHL game since March 2019. 
We don't know what he is, okay? He looked like a really great AHL player a year ago, had a great camp, but he, missed, he hasn't played a game in almost a year. Remember the season-ending injury happened in Chicago last November, which feels like years ago at this point. So I like Tate Thompson as a person and a player. I think he could be very good, but it's a very risky proposition to rely on a guy like that right now. Go sign Cahoon. Give him a million bucks. Just don't overpay. All right, on to the next one. Okay. Um, uh, sorry. Received a text message. It threw me off. I'm Lance Lysowski, Sabres Bureau for the Buffalo News, answering your questions. We keep this going, guys. If you have more questions, I only got two left here. So as of right now, I'm going to answer those, and, and we're going to close out for the night. So I do appreciate everybody who has participated. It's been a blast. It always is. Okay, Andrea, that's good to know about the Sabres draft selection criteria. I would have been very upset if the Sabres drafted him. Andrea, the one thing that I kept hearing, I will show this because this is an interesting point that I've heard. There were some people who thought the Sabres' previous regime was too strict in their scouting model. If players didn't match specific criteria and character was at the top of the list, they were immediately removed from the, from the Sabres draft board. Now, one of those was work ethic. It was giving up on plays. It was a lack of effort. That is why the Sabres removed Arthur Kaliev, the Los Angeles Kings second-round pick who had a good year in the OHL last year, from their draft board. A lack of effort. It wasn't character concerns. It was giving up on plays. There were some real questions about the kid's work ethic. And a lot of teams also had those same questions. That's why he fell in the draft to where he did. Now, you can draft a player like that, if you feel like there's good structure and the team is going to, I think that really where the Sabres were with a guy like Kaliev, and they've done this over the past, this is just one example, not picking on Arthur Kaliev, because I think he's going to be a good player, is that they just liked Ryan Johnson, and they just liked other players at a Kaliev at that point, just given the question there, you know. I don't, Kaliev, I don't think, was removed from their draft board entirely, but he was knocked down significantly. Um, for the the work ethic piece. Um, the character one is, from what I was told, under Botterill, if there were any character concerns, and this is something that Jason picked up in Pittsburgh, you are off the draft board. And you know what? I absolutely agree with it. That's the one the one question I would have. I believe in second chances, but I'm sorry. I, I think you gotta be a little, you got to be cautious there, um, especially when you're building an organization, you're trying to create a culture in the American Hockey League with your pros, you know, with your development staff. And these are future Sabres. I mean, that's, you know, you keep hearing that. It's cliche, but you, know, you want to get the next wave of players. And if you have serious concerns, um, you want to, to address those. So, uh, okay, Chuck, uh, what one player could be the biggest reason they improve enough to make the playoffs? Ooh, Chuck, I like this question. Uh, Chuck, I'm going to go with Rasmus Dahlin. Uh, and, I, and I'm saying this because if he takes that top line role, which Kruger better give Darlene an opportunity to do that, and I think Darlene has all of the physical tools to do it right now, wow. Like, if Darlene becomes a better player at 5-on-5 five five and not just a power play ace, wow, this team is dynamic. You know, and if you look at Darlene's impacts when he's on the ice with Jack Eichel. You know, when you can trust Dahlin to be in that role, this team is so much better. He lifts every player he's on the ice with. That's why I know a lot of people around the league want to talk about Quinn Hughes or Kale McCarr, but they don't make their teammates better the way that Rasmus Dahlin has through his first two seasons. Now, of course, there are also other answers to this question. If Linus Allmark becomes that number one guy, absolutely. If, he be, if his PK save percentage is in the 880 range to 890, this team is fantastic. Like this team is is going to make the playoffs. You need that guy to. You need your goaltender to take that next step. But I think with Darlene, how he can make players better, how he can elevate that top power play unit to potentially be among the best in the league. Now it is important to remember that Taylor Hall is not a power play ace by any means. Honestly, I would not be surprised if he ends up on that second unit, perhaps because I I think that Kruger likes that dynamic of that top group, but. You know, I think that this team, if they get that top power play rolling and they're in the top 10 in the league in, in, in power play, if Darlene can be that guy in a 5-on-5 five five that lifts everybody up and he's playing 24 minutes a night, wow. I mean, this group could be, could, could be I mean, they could be in the mix. They, they could absolutely be in the mix, in my opinion. Okay, um, thank you for the question, Chuck. That was a great one. Jody, have you heard anything about an assistant general manager? Jody, the Sabres, like, 
a lot of other teams. You saw Pittsburgh today fire their assistant GM, and they're not going to hire a full-time one for a while. Organizations are waiting to see what's going to happen with the American Hockey League. It's a big piece of this. They're also waiting to see what's going to happen with the National Hockey League. Um, if you're not having fans in the seats, you're not going to want to commit $250,000 of salary to an assistant GM right now. That's why you've seen a lot of guys who have been let go with other teams. And this includes Jason Botterill, Randy Sexton, and Steve Greeley. I was told all three of those have received interest from other organizations. Um, I've, I've heard specific teams linked. Well, one, I've heard specific teams linked to Greeley and Sexton in particular. But teams are waiting, right? You're waiting to see what your revenue is going to look like. You know, there's no reason to hire somebody to run your American Hockey League organization when roster construction isn't really a question right now. A lot of AHL veterans haven't been signed yet. I'm, I'm going to just name off a few from the, the Amherst last year, like John Gilmore's unsigned, Remy Ellie's unsigned, uh, Andrew Hammond's unsigned. Those kind of guys who you fill out your AHL rosters with, you don't need to go ahead and sign them. There's no rush. So you wait. I think you're going to see assistant GMs. I think you're going to see hockey operations staff really start to fill out maybe as we get in December, as long as everything goes according to plan in terms of, you know, the season getting underway. But, yes, I have been told the Sabres have spoken about this internally. Their plan is not to keep the staff, their hockey operations staff, as small as it is right now. Now, it's not going to be as big as it was under Jason Botterill, but it's it's not going to be as small. Um I will caution them, though. They need to hire more scouts. You can't just not have scouts in Sweden and in Finland, uh, especially when the, there's games going on there. It's in, in crazy to me that they're relying on video scouting right now when it comes to those players. It's egregious. Um, it's one thing that if next time Kevin Adams speaks, it's something that needs to be addressed. They need to hire a scout over there. Um, maybe they have hired one. I haven't heard anything um, from people I've spoken to. Um, they have hired one scout in the past month or so, but he's based in Chicago which is basically where Jer Jeremiah Crow's territory used to be. Jeremiah Crow was based in Chicago, used to cover those those areas. Okay, Will, uh, who do you think it's likely going to be picked from Seattle? Chances are Posa, we throw them a sweetener. Uh, you can't, but you would need Ocposa to waive his no-movement clause, right? He has one. So um, right now you're looking at a guy like Zemmus Jurgensen's. You're looking at like Cody Eakin, uh, Colin Miller. Uh, nobody's going to want to pick Jonas Johansson. That's the one goalie the Sabres could probably expose at that point. So it's not going to be a big-time player. Will usually isn't. Now, the one thing with Ocposa to keep an eye on in the coming weeks is the second buyout window. It's only 24 hours long. It's going to occur after Olsen is under contract. Is he an option there? You do save money, um, but I do know how much Ralph Kruger loves Kyle Ocposo. Um, Ocposo is a character guy. He's a guy that I know that a lot of fans don't care about this nowadays because, you know, the guy isn't playing up to that contract. I'm not going to really fault him at this point. It's concussions. It's been a lot of things that have gone Kyle Oc against Kyle Ocposo. But he's really important in that dressing room. He really is. Um, he has been very important to Jack Eichel. Now, you can probably afford to maybe lose some leadership. Um with the additions of guy like Eric Stahl and uh, you know, Cody Eakin and Taylor Hall, you know, to a certain extent, um, but you still need guys who are, are character pieces who like who are really good with young players. And Kyle Ocposo is he's really good with young players. Uh, a heck of a, a heck of a guy to have in that room, and he became an effective fourth line player. And I think there's more. I think there's more offense there. Um, I think he needs to get his shot back. That's something that I think he lost when he missed time with the concussions over those couple of years. Because if he gets the shot back, then you can sort of utilize him in the power play because you don't need as much speed. He can really adapt a little bit on that second power play unit. Um, again, I would caution this team to get rid of too many leaders. Um, you know, yeah, you could plug in probably Toby Reader on that fourth line and maybe get more uh, on the PK, but you're, you're going to lose something in terms of character. And, and I, I don't think now is the right time to buy a post. So if you want to do it next off season, or you want to try to, to add a sweetener in to, to give him to Seattle. Great. It would have to be a heck of a sweetener though. I think for Seattle to want to do it. And I'm not getting rid of draft picks right now, especially probably a pretty high one that you would need to give them. You know, they're probably going to want like a second round pick to take a, a contract like our post does. Uh, Dave, Good to hear from you, Dave. This is my last question, by the way, guys. Thank you so much for everybody who joined me. If you have anything you want to ask via, you know, send me an email. I'll be happy to answer it. For anybody who's who submitted one for a mailbag and hasn't made it in, I'm sorry. Like we have limited space for those. Sometimes there's a lot of overlap. 
So I have to pick and choose which ones to include. But I know, Jody, you've asked quite a few mailbag questions, so I always appreciate that. Dave, when will the players and coaches be in town? Dave, a few players are already in town. I know Tage Thompson and Ocposo are. Um, Dylan Cousins is going to be in town soon if he hasn't been already because it's very difficult for him to get ice up in uh, the Yukon right now. I know he's been ha- he had to go to British Columbia there for a little bit. And the coaches are in town. I know that at least Rob Kruger is. I have not. I actually spoke to Steve Smith a week and a half ago, and I forgot to ask him if he's in town yet. But yes, um, they are starting to become. In, they are starting to get in town. Of course, the coaches can't work on the ice of the players, but the players can wa- work in small groups. The thing is, though, that's going to prevent some guys from doing it is that you have to undergo the testing protocols. And a lot of these guys, I know Jack Eichel is included in this. They want to work with their skill coaches. They want to take advantage of this time to work with their coaches. Like Jeff Skinner works with a number of people up into the Toronto area. So I would assume I haven't touched base with Jeff Skinner's, um, his, uh, his people uh, recently, but I know that he likes to work out and he's got a very strict regimen and he can't follow that in Buffalo. So he will, he will be one of the guys who reports later. Um, Will, it's just laughable to have a fourth line player making, you know, well, I get it. Like, and you just said that you get it as well. It, it, it's not ideal. Okay. To pay $6 million to a fourth line player who isn't scoring or producing enough points to justify a $6 million contract. But, you know, Kyle Ocposo has made the absolute, in my opinion, it's not like the guy hasn't worked hard. He's put everything into it. <clears throat> it's not like this is a player whose skill set has deteriorate, deteriorated based on a lack of effort. Um, I'm not even questioning the contract to begin with because, you know what, it's not it's not like they could have for, foreseen Kyle Ocposo suffering the concussion that he did, right? In the first couple of years, he was on really bad teams. It's a really shame how this has worked out. But Kyle Ocposo has made the absolute best of the situation. He's worked diligently to make himself an effective player. It was a tough pill to swallow for him at first, to go down to the fourth line, to receive fewer minutes, to lose his 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 role on the power play. But he adapted. He's become more of a you know, he's bring a, he's brought a different element, and he was an outstanding last season for Ralph Kruger. He really sets an example of how Ralph Kruger wants his teams to play and Based on my conversations with with Ralph, and I've had extensive ones with him about team construction, about roster building, about philosophy, I know how much he values a player like Ocposo. And I really seriously doubt that he's going to want to just say goodbye to Kyle Ocposo at this point in time. It's still too early in Ralph Kruger's mission to build a culture, to build the way that he wants this team to play. And if they can make it work financially, which they will be able to, um, I see Ocposo staying. The one thing I do see the Sabres doing, and I will tell you this before I, I say goodbye to you guys, is I do see them trading a defenseman at some point to unload salary. I don't know that for certain. That's the one move I see them making that would make sense at this point because they can bring up Will Borgen and they can create some cap space by trading somebody like Colin Miller or, or Brandon Montour. So... That's it for this week, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Some really great questions. We went a little long, uh, which I always tend to do because we have really great questions. And I think it's just an opportunity to give you, give everybody a, a chance to you know, say what's on your mind. So stay safe. Be well. I'm Lance Lysowski, the Sabres beat writer for the Buffalo, the Buffalo News. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.